Welcome to this segment of Kaiser Report Summer Solutions Series. Okay, so revolving doors and money in politics, AKA legal bribery, the nice democratic transparent sort of corruption in which, oh, we're just lobbyists and or billionaires using our cash, which has free speech and even human rights, thanks to the US Supreme Court studies have shown that the ordinary schmuck consumer citizen voter has exactly zero impact on the legislative bodies they quote unquote elect, for most laws are written by lobbyists from the very industries to which your elected representatives will decamp as soon as their public service, end quote, to you is over. Now to find out if there are any solutions, it's time now to go to Los Angeles and speak with author Nomi Prince, who is currently researching her next book, Artisans of Money, The Rise of Central Bank Power, Artificial Markets, and Financial Warfare. Nomi, welcome to Summer Solutions. Thank you, Max. Okay, so Nomi, there are few more lucrative revolving doors than that between DC and Wall Street. Tell us about the scale of that revolving door. Well, the revolving door between Wall Street and Washington is bigger than simply campaign contributions, bigger than super PAC contributions, bigger than the enormous number of lobbyists that continue to sprout uh, going into Washington from Wall Street. It has to also do with these long-standing, multi-generational, multi-decade relationships between Wall Street and Washington and the symbiosis that the two have in terms of running the United States domestically and also from an international and foreign perspective. So even going back to the first Securities Exchange Commission SEC head was, was Joe Kennedy, who was part of the contingent that raised money for FDR, who was a progressive president, put in the New Deal, put in Glass-Steagall to separate bank risk from the public's deposits. Um, you know, he, he was a guy who effectively uh, was a, a major revolving door person, as at the time was Sidney Weinberg, who ran Goldman Sachs almost into the ground, but then thought it would be a good idea if he could turn around, be a part of FDR's financing team, and also get FDR's ear with respect to policies going forward. This was before lobbyists. So all of these individual relationships started back a long time ago, and they've been consistent throughout the years. We had David Rockefeller in the ear of um, of basically all sorts of presidents, as we had Walter Riston, who was the head of, of, of Citibank, and, and, and individuals who basically used the revolving door of appointments and not simply money in between Wall Street and Washington. Bill Clinton, of course, solidified that relationship by bringing Robert Rubin, who was uh, the co-head of Goldman Sachs, into the Treasury Secretary Department. George W. Bush thought that was a great idea as well and brought Hank Paulson, who was the chair of Goldman Sachs, into running the Treasury Department. So the issue with Wall Street in Washington is it transcends simply money, which is a huge element, into these relationships that go on really forever. Hmm. Right. So uh, let's get into some specifics here. So many Wall Street firms have now set up research departments in Washington, D.C., where insider trading is not illegal, by the way. And politicians are allowed to trade on inside information, and studies show that they, not surprisingly, outperform markets. Now, we don't call this corruption, but should we? We should definitely. It is corruption. Insider trading is insider trading. The fact that we have a Congress that is above the laws that actually would bind ordinary citizens who don't have the ability to affect those laws or be Congress people taking um, leverage of them is is definitely corruption. It, it's it's crime. It is insider trading. It's also corruption to have the campaign system that we have, the super PAC system that we have, the lobbying system that we have, connecting to the revolving door where individuals can come in and out of Washington, use policies, make them effective for the banks or other types of corporations that they come into or out of and move on. We've had old Treasury secretaries like Tim Geithner move into Warburg. We have had uh, Alan Greenspan move in and out of J.P. Morgan into other types of, of hedge funds. We've had the most senior people that run uh, um, not just policy, not just are involved in creating and passing legislation, but actually run the major, most powerful institutions in our country, go in and out of the private sector in such a way that they benefit themselves, which is 
a problem. And also they benefit the not just the private sector, but the individual companies to which they go. And that's part of the deal. Jack Lew, who is currently the Treasury Secretary of the United States, came out of a plump position at Citigroup. And one of the elements in his actual contract was that he would get paid a larger bonus if he went to get a bigger position in Washington. What did he get? He got to be the Deputy Secretary of State for Hillary Clinton and the Treasury Secretary for President Barack Obama. So he got a double whammy. That helped Citigroup. Move that forward, Citigroup was one of only one of only eight major banks in the United States who was said to have passed its most recent living will test. All other banks either failed or were called out by the Federal Reserve of the FDIC. The one bank that survived the test, which is in dire straits anyway, was Citigroup. Not ironic, because Citigroup, Jack Lew, same thing, just one sitting in Washington, one sitting in Wall Street. So there's a tremendous problem of just not just corruption, but also really changing the very nature of what government does with respect to Wall Street because of the relationships that go back and forth between the two poles. Now, I mean, you were a managing director at Goldman Sachs. Was there something in the culture there, or was there something you can tell us from inside the organization where they communicated, discussed, or put out forward this idea that the bank had a special relationship with politicians in Washington, D.C.? First of all, they, they had a lot of fundraising elements that they were involved in, and they did have a relationship with Washington. It was almost unwritten because it was, when you get to that sort of an elite circle, um, and that is how they operate, the, the doors to Washington are never shut. They don't revolve. They're just simply continuously open. So the idea that anyone would go, uh, any of the senior management would not be in office that day because they were in D.C. Was, was a pretty regular occurrence. The idea was to continue to make Washington a place that, that worked for the benefit of Goldman Sachs. The special relationship went back again decades. It went back relation. It went back um, for multiple presidents on both sides of the aisle. Um, and that was something that was very much a part of the culture of Goldman Sachs. You had, when I was there, Hank Paulson, who was obviously a Republican, became the Treasury Secretary for Bush, running the firm. But then you had Lloyd Blankfein, who is now running the firm, who was a Democrat and was more associated um, with, with the Clintons and, and so forth. So they really covered both sides of the aisle, that was not by just design, that was by these historic relationships. So the idea of Washington being close um, was very much a part of, of what went on. And, and so that continues. Um, and also, it grows, because right now we have Hillary Clinton potentially um, definitely going to be the nominee for the Democratic Party, definitely a friend of Goldman Sachs. It was Goldman Sachs that got Bill Clinton into the White House to begin with, Robert Rubin, that gave him a legitimacy to even have that position, to have us be the recipients of, of decades of, of Clinton-esque rule in Washington, um, and this is going to continue going forward. So though I have left, I know from inside and I know from outside that the special relationship with Washington remains not just coveted, but accepted. It's just, it's just part of the identity of all the right, firm. Now, uh, Hillary Clinton, she's received more donations from Wall Street than all the other candidates combined. She's made millions in speeches to the likes of Goldman Sachs. And yet she insists Wall Street expects nothing in return. Is that viable? And also, just out of curiosity, have you ever heard of Hillary's speech <laughs> while you were at Goldman Sachs? Know me, friends. Um, well, she, I was, I was uh, at Goldman Sachs before she, she needed to make money uh, speaking there. Um, but she, uh, of course, she is beholden to the banking sector. Of course, the, the friendships, the associations, the money, the speaking engagement, I mean, it's all really part of being on the same team. The reason those transcripts aren't disclosed is not because, oh, that's not what they do or any of the excuses that she gives on any given day. It's because the, the, the language, the, the, the sort of patting on the back, the I'm on your side, I get you kind of language is not something that, that she wants disclosed ever. Um, and so what is said to Wall Street versus what she says to the public are, are 
definitely two very different things. And what she will do for Wall Street versus what she says she will do to the public are two very different things. She's on this sort of shadow banking kick in terms of uh, saying her policies to to fix Wall Street, to, to, uh, to dampen uh, the risk that Wall Street uh, provides to the rest of the country is somehow better than, for example, Bernie Sanders' idea of breaking up the banks, of bringing back Glass-Steagall, of, of summarily making it illegal for an institution to have any ties to government, uh, to deposits or to government aid in the case of a crisis or, or bankruptcy or, or any sort of negative factor. She has not said any of that. She talks about, oh, the shadow banking system, it's something I need to go after. Um, and the language is almost as shadowy as the banking system. The shadow banking system is a bunch of financial institutions, whether they're hedge funds or private equity funds or other smaller private banks that receive their funding through the major big banks that are supported by the government currently legally. So she's not about to change any of that. And she's not about to really admonish any of that. And so whatever she says to a meeting at or a speech at one of these institutions is merely to indicate she is on the same side. And maybe there's outside problems like the economy, like shadow banks, like something that doesn't involve them specifically. But that's merely to prove to them that she actually understands them and will help them. And they know this. They don't give her money just for the sheer hell of it. They give her money because she is one of their people. She has been one of their people for decades. And that's not about to change if she's in the White House whatsoever at all. And we will see that if she, if she comes into the White House, if she becomes the president. We will have this conversation, you and I, Max, in five years from now. And we will see that she has done absolutely nothing, that the big banks are bigger. There's probably another crisis looming. There's a bunch of other corruption below the surface that we don't call corruption. We just kind of let it slide as business as usual. There'll be more multi-billion dollar settlements with the big banks, and they will continue to go on with what they do. All right, so you've done an excellent job in researching the historical evidence of banker shenanigans. And one period, of course, the 1920s, led to the crash of uh, the 1929 era and the subsequent depression. Then you had, as you point out, uh, historically speaking, the, 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 the new rules and laws came in. Uh, you, you had the Glass-Steagall come in. You had the Securities Act of 33 and 34, of course, very famous. And uh, you're also pointing to the fact that, like bookends, you've got the same criminals, almost the same bloodlines, committing the same acts in the same way. Are the, we have about 20 seconds left, but are the solutions to this situation today the same solutions as FDR brought in in the 30s? That is to say, Glass-Steagall and other such acts. Nomi. Yeah, they definitely are, because the solution isn't go There's no solution that's going to keep the relationships from existing. There's, there's no solutions that's going to keep people who went to Harvard together decades ago and their families decades ago to, to not continue to help each other and be on the same team. So you have to provide at least summarily uh, legislative solutions, like Glass-Steagall, like breaking up the banks, like reducing the percentage of market share of deposits and of assets and of derivatives and of trading that they are allowed to do so that they cannot incur instability and risk onto the system. So there's two elements of law that really need to happen because the relationships themselves are not necessarily going to happen. But you should, we should strengthen this, this resolve to not have at least the revolving door from a functional perspective, at least require more years or or infinity years for someone to go from a senior position in Washington to a senior position in Wall Street. And that actually can be a law. You cannot get the friendships out of the way. You can't get the mentality of being on the same social status page out of the way. But there are things we can do from a legal standpoint to at least alleviate the time um, between Washington and Wall Street, and also to cut the size of the banks, to cut the amount of their risk, to cut the percentage of assets and deposits that they control um, of our own money. So these are things that, that can be legitimate solutions. And, and part of them were enacted in, the th in 1933, and part were enacted throughout the decades that followed by both both Republican and Democratic presidents before the banks woke up and said, no, 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 we don't want to have any more rules. We're going to send more people in. And that's really what we're dealing with today. All right, Naomi Prince, thanks so much for being on Kaiser Report Summer Solutions. Thank you. I'd like to thank our guest, Naomi Prinz. You can find her on nomiprinz.com. Stay tuned for the second half. A whole lot more solutions. Welcome to this segment of Summer Solutions. 
In the first half, we saw what happens when bankers own your elected officials. But other corporate lobbyists are making headway in convincing governments across the world to spurn their voters' demands and introduce policies and trade deals that threaten sovereignty and basic human rights. No other industry encapsulates this more than big oil, and in particular, the fracking side of the energy play. Not only did then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton travel across Europe to press governments to take on the quote unquote controversial natural gas and oil extraction method, she succeeded. Nowhere more so than in the UK. With us today is Tina Rothery, who has been at the forefront of the fight to stop it. Tina, welcome back. Hi, nice to be back. Stacey, welcome, welcome. Welcome to Summer Solutions. I must tell you it's summer because despite it only being just past noon, uh, London looks like this. Now, Tina Rothery, Tina Louise Rothery, you have fought hard and long for against fracking being introduced to the United Kingdom, but Hillary Clinton, uh, she's broken those glass ceilings, mm. breaking it by being such a strong uber woman traveling around Europe and convincing all these men and women who run Europe to take fracking. Mm -hmm. they, she won here. Fracking is now allowed in North Yorkshire. Uh, tell us about that decision. Tell us how it came about and against what sort of opposition. Okay, so the UK has only been fracked once. Let's not forget that bit. Uh, 2011, April, caused two minor earthquakes, a little bit of seismic up in Blackpool. So it was halted, restarted again the potential to frack in December 2012. <clears throat> However, um, the planning went through again in Blackpool. We stopped it last July, and our councillors said no based on the huge amount of opposition and the clear and present danger that fracking presents. However, they found a soft spot over in Yorkshire, a council that um, re relates to a site called in a town called Kirby Mispeton. Now, the council there is primarily conservative. Um, there's a pre-drilled site that was from old conventional drilling. So it was a lot easier to slip your planning through there. Um, the vote was 7-4. Actually, one of the conservatives actually did say no. It was six conservative councillors and one right-leaning independent. And we knew it would go through. Now, there was 96% of all male, oh no, 99.2% of all correspondence relating to that planning was against it. And so despite that, they thought the 0.8% was enough along with these seven councillors to say yes. However, what we thought was really odd at the time is ordinarily when the shale gas industry in the last five years, we watch the stock market in relation to them. Usually when they do a surge like that, something joyous happens, there's a, a surge on the market. Now there was next to nothing, mm -hmm. tiny blip, which was really strange because quite often when we do stuff, uh, we read in the press that it says, you know, UK public shale gas opposition deters investors. So we've known for a long time that our government is both ignorant, fraudulent and corrupt. So we are probably better off trying to cut its supply line, which is the investors, um, by making them aware that we won't stop. So we are still five years frack free. No truck has moved yet. There's currently loads of issues in Northern Ireland at Woodburn Forest at the moment. Um, they're really mowing down protesters there, but they haven't actually got very far with the drilling. Scotland still under a moratorium at the moment, now fighting to get a complete ban. We'll see where that one goes, but uh, yeah. That's sure. the current situation. I mean, as you pointed out, the, de the, the people spoke and the people were against it. Uh, fracking first started in Texas, in Denton, Texas. Yeah. The people of Denton, Texas, after five or six, seven years of fracking in their backyard, which has destroyed the value of their homes, destroyed their health, and destroyed their water, they voted in their own referendum yeah. to ban fracking. Higher authorities in the state came in and said, you're not allowed to ban fracking oh, ever. So astounding. I, I think this is, is this seems to be the sort of thing you're talking about here. Um, in the first half, we talked to Nomi Prinz about the revolving door between government mm -hmm. and these corporations. So uh, that certainly happens in Texas, where they banned the the referendums available to uh, welcome to summer, <laughs> ban, the, ban the possibility to ban fracking. Here, like, what? who are the corporate voices speaking? Who are the big corporations involved in this? Uh, presumably Chevron and American Yeah, but, but also companies like, but you see, we think they've sent a couple of small sacrificial guys forward first. Yeah. Quadrilla's not a big company. It's financed by Riverstone Holdings, which is financed by Kerrigan in China and AJ Lucas in Australia, um, and was previously headed up by Lord Brown, who's now 
nipped over to Russia to lend his services there. He used to be at BP. Yes, yeah. and, and he used to say that, you know, the Russians were the threat, and then suddenly when Cordula wasn't doing so well, he thought he'd join Russia. Um, and, of course, he's Lord Brown. He worked with the Department of Energy and Climate Change for many years and appoints people to their roles there. Department of Energy and Climate Change is our regulator. So, so, so Tina... Uh, let's talk a little bit about your personal odyssey in all of this, because mm, you, what you, an odyssey! You, you, <laughs> you, you've stood up. You're like the Rachel Corey, you know, uh, against the frackers, yeah. and um, of course, Rachel Corey in the end yes. met uh, quite yes. an unpleasant end, trying, trying to, to avoid that, defend the, the, the rights of, of uh, the Palestinians. Yeah. But so you you are um, taking on a cause against big frack big fracking, yeah. and now um, tell us what's the current situation. Is. Well, in um, 2014, in the summer. Um, 26 primarily grandmothers took a field at 5 o'clock in the morning from under the noses of the security guards, and we held it for three weeks. Uh, we said we were leaving on a set date. We did a 50-person fingertip search, left it beautiful, um, told the farmer we'd gone. It was to draw attention to the fact that this field is earmarked for fracking, and loads of the elderly in the area had no idea that was going to happen. Um, so we did that. We alerted the community. We felt it was the service they needed. And when we left, they then evicted us the day after we'd gone. And they ran up 55000 in court costs doing that. They then said that it would be one of the nanas, um, someone from the nanas would have to take the hit. And that if someone didn't step forward, they would just find someone on video. And I was the poorest of our group, the nanas, so it was easier because they couldn't steal anything of mine. And so I stepped forward. So now I'm up in court on the 24th of June, and they'd like the money or some reason why I can't afford to pay. I've explained that it's not that I can't afford to pay, which I can't, it's that I will not pay money to people to commit crime. So to me, morally, I, I actually can't fulfill this obligation. So what happens after that? I'm, I'm in, a, in a little bit of a quagmire. I'm not really entirely uh, just sure. Just so you know, uh, we are recording this uh, before July, but this will air in July. Let's talk a bit about um, Quadrilla. Now, Quadrilla first became quite prominent when there was, uh, they were covered in the news but not allowed to be mentioned. There was a corporation, we heard, who was dumping toxic waste off of Africa. That, uh, because of libel laws here, they were not allowed to mention it until a member of parliament stood up in parliament and said it was Quadrilla. Yeah. This was the corporation. So here the government knows they were already able to... <laughs> wow. It's like getting more, more apocalyptic now. <laughs> Well, As a the omen, dun, 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 dun. But, but so you're up against these guys who mm. were who were allegedly or not allegedly dumping toxic waste off of Africa, and uh, they they were able to use the force of the law here to stop people from yeah. even knowing that. Now they've been given rights to uh, frack your, um, you know, your countryside, and of course there's corporate com confidentiality there. So they're, they all their it's proprietary what they dump into the water. Yeah. Uh, so w w how do you stop this going forward? What are you going to do? What is your pl plan of action? Our plan of action is, A, it's, it's we, you've already told us this before, how cash-strapped this industry is and what a boondoggle it is. And uh, so we're kind of hoping in the end that the oil price, the lack of funding, might help us out in the end. And, and also, you know, what have you got to fight with? I'm a grandmother. I have nothing but truth and a deliberate need and obligation to protect my young. So nothing they can do can stop me protecting my young, and I will not, under any circumstances, do anything to make it easier for them. They and I know so they, many who are the Max same. As Max said, they were, losing, they were losing money when oil was 100 and something yeah. dollars. I mean, it's natural gas they're fracking, yes, though, right? Yes. And, and yeah. There's an oversupply of natural gas. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the price has crashed. They're not making money in America where there are no regulations. They have an exemption from the Clean Water Act. Yeah. Here, they won't have an exemption from the Clean Water Act. However, we have reduced our monitoring, which okay. is interesting. They weren't... We don't have a Clean Air and Water Act, so we thought, how are they going to get around that? We looked at it, and what it is is they've underfunded air monitoring stations across the country. I think it was reduced by half. So if they do pollute, it's just going to be harder to spot it. Well, so. now, uh, Scotland is banned fracking. Yes. Well, it's got a moratorium, and, and the ban was voted for, but it was a non-binding ban, and it has to come back up again in, in Parliament. So, yes, but they, um, they're they strong against it. Um, actually, I'm up there next week, which is fantastic, because I was going up to rally, um, but now I'm going up to celebrate with them, which is be fantastic, because they are a strong force. Another thing to look forward to, of course, is in Wyoming, there are famous photos you can see of abandoned oil uh, fracking wells. They were abandoning those when oil was $100. Yeah. But they weren't making enough money to pay all the investors, so they just abandoned the wells. Yeah. And the, the company, they create individual companies, offshore vehicles, to own the, the fracking yeah. well. They go bankrupt. Yeah. And 
presumably somebody in North Yorkshire, the taxpayers of the United Kingdom, will have to pay for the cleanup. Look, I mean, let's just go to the bottom line. Why? why we just expressed why this is a, it's not 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 economic to frack. It's a health hazard. Carcinogenics are everywhere. People don't want it. No. So why does it happen? Because the government guarantees the bank loans. Government guarantees mm -hmm. the bank loans. These are banks that are technically insolvent, and they're looking uh, ever you know more, for more fees to keep the charade going that they are solvent, and the government steps in to say, you know, this is a horrible industry, it kills our people, and it's a disaster ecologically, but we'll guarantee the loan as a way, it's a bailout for the banks. It has so nothing to do with lose. energy. The banks can't lose on this. They can't lose on it because they need, it's like a bailout. In other words, the government could just bail out RBS and HSBC and Lloyds and, 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 and these other banks. Barclays that, is one Barclays. of the worst. Barclays. They could, they could just write them a check, but instead they're going to say, we're going to guarantee a loan to this dead industry of fracking, wink, wink, oh, and here's your subsidy. It's been a really strong call out for a, a, um, a boycott of Barclays. People are cutting the cards, changing Hey, banks. it worked during the apartheid era. Yeah. Oh, but they're banning boycotts. Uh, to anything to do with apartheid, but it's time to go. Oh, we gotta uh, go. It's, uh, the apocalypse is upon us. Tina, <laughs> gotta hit, cover the yeah. apocalypse. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much. Thanks for having me again. That's it for this Summer Solutions episode of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Tina Rothery. If you'd like to get in touch, tweet us at Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.